Hey everyone, welcome back to Business Casual with Mark and Rob. And we have Thomas Lorini on the show today, all the way from beautiful Irvine, California. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. Yeah, we're we're uh, sharing with him the nice uh, snowy weather, and uh, he's 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 here looking at deals, <laughs> or he's at least he's here staying in one of his deals that I sold him. What was it like ten years ago? Yeah, absolutely. Staying that place. It's yeah. beautiful. There you go. All right. Well, so uh, Thomas Larini, uh, you've been investing for a heck of a long time. You are you Canadian. You moved down to the states. You're doing development down there now, man. There's so much to unpack here. So let's start. Let's start from the beginning, from when we met. Yes, I mean we're talking about 12, 13 years ago. We met, and uh, you sold me my first official rental property, Mark, a duplex over in Hamilton off of Lock Street. Yeah, that you still own today. Still own it. I've I've contemplated selling it a few times over the years, but uh, it's in such a great spot. And I decided to do some renovations about a year and a half ago and keep it. And it's been really good to me. Uh, when, I don't, when I don't stay in it, when I'm visiting, um, it's an Airbnb. And in terms of its location, vicinity, closest to my parents, uh, it's just been, worked very well for us as a family. All right. Well, yeah, I took your calculator away. But do you remember what you paid for that? Actually, I do. Uh, we paid 265 with a 10K credit. So... Officially, I think it was two fifty-five. Wow! Right, so two fifty-five. It was two units, wasn't it? It was two units. Yep, yeah, up yeah. and down. Still two units. Still two units with a separate garage. Yeah, the one garage of the only is one. Yeah, one of the only garages in the area. Uh, it's separate. It's got its own driveway, so you got parking inside and outside. So, really good. Right. So, what do you get for rent on that now? So what I done as an Airbnb. Um, I've basically partnered with an individual who arbitrages. So I basically get four grand a month and all, and then the individual pays everything else. You know, I just pay tax and insurance. That's, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. I'm not complaining. So four grand a month off your $255,000 purchase. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> What's your cash flow look like on something like that? Um, well, I've only got about a debt remaining on a thing about 130 grand. Wow. So, I mean, it's cash flowing beautifully. Uh, I'm con- contemplating pulling up some equity. I did dump in quite a bit of money, changed the roof, changed the entire basement, um, an internal weeping system because those older basements in Hamilton, you know how they are. Well, I remember that's why I think you got the 10 grand off way back in the day because it was a little wet down there. Yeah. So, we initially did that when we first acquired it. We initially did a little bit of a, a draining system in the, in the front. But then over the years, when I had basement tenant, it would tend to leak after heavy rains. So once I decided to go full on, um, basically guide the entire basement, removed all the drywall, put a complete draining system on the, on the whole perimeter of that basement, uh, and then just did a whole weeping system. And then from there, hasn't leaked since. Basement's finished, um, and now, now it's an Airbnb. So I guess the moral of this story is buy in a good location, Long and boring. Long and boring. Sit on it and wait. Absolutely. And you'll win. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would imagine this property is probably in the nine hundred range, value, value wise. I, I would probably think you're, you're close to that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Who knows with the, the lower interest rates today, maybe even nine fifty. Possibly, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with that thing. So I may refinance, pull some equity out of it in the next, uh, you know, few months, and then, you know, reposition something else, but. On this particular one, keeping it for long term. All right. Well, so maybe talk to us a bit about that, because obviously you live in the states. Your income is derived in the states now. You still own some in Ontario. Yep. I know you sold some too. Yes. How is the refinance process on that? Yeah, good question. Um, not that easy yeah. <laughs> as a non-resident. However, you know, utilizing some B lenders. Um, you know, my, my brokers have been able to help me uh, with some of these refis. They do utilize my American income, their calculations. Um, but interesting enough, with this particular property, I still have the, you know, the original um, Scotia loan on it with that step program. So mm-hmm. I'm able to access some, equ- some equity, but, you know, they go off of the original valuation. 
So you're talking like, when was that? Like, again, 2013, yeah, 2012? I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, so your long global time. limit on that is from what you purchased it at, really. Exactly. Mm. So it's not a huge amount of equity to tap into currently. So again, the plan is to refinance that. And most likely it's going to be a B lender. And I've done it with other, other properties here in Canada, um, especially when they're in a personal name. So those first number of few properties are still remaining my personal name versus now, I mean, the, the balance of my portfolio in Canada are through corporations. And it's a lot easier uh, when it's through corporations. If I've got partners in it, Canadian partners, it makes it even easier. Well, also, I think your newer stuff is more commercial too, is that? Yeah, commercial, mixed use, correct. So yeah. that also helps. So yeah. before we go down that rabbit hole, like since like 2013, did you just jump right from two unit properties right into multifamily or like how did you? Yeah, I mean, it was initially a slow progress for me. Like I didn't have any of this master plan. I didn't really think I was getting into real estate to well, the extent you, I am now. Because you were an engineer. Yeah. So my background was mechanical engineering. I had my own machining company in Vaughan. You know, you even, you even visited, I think, once. And uh, I was just buying rental properties slowly on the side. So I went from that duplex, a single family, a couple condos, um, a townhouse. And then, you know, once we planned to move to the States was when it was like, all right, what's the, what's the, what, what, are, what are our plans? So I didn't decide to sell the business, move to the States and get into real, t- real estate full time. Um, so when we initially moved, I think I had about five, six properties. When here did in Canada. you move to the States? Uh, just for time. Yeah, 2014. Okay. So we're talking between like 2010, 11 when I started real estate, you know, investing to about 2014. You know, in four years, only about five, six properties. So it wasn't like again this huge portfolio. It really was when I transitioned to full time to real estate, and I get to the U.S. Didn't know anybody, and because I had a strong network here in Canada, I just continued to leverage that and do more deals in Canada, and that's when I started JVing. So the JV game for me has been has been a game changer because it was a quickly an escalation from there you know just kind of like boom five plex eight plex eight plex 22 and so forth so um you know everyone's got different strategy for me it just made sense because once i moved much more difficult for me to qualify for mortgages on my own so the partnership was just my you know uh, my forte and um so yeah so Right. So you went down to the States, you're buying multifamilies in Canada still, and you started, when did you start acquiring things in the U.S.? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, Once I moved to the States, even though I was a permanent resident, it wasn't like I can get traditional financing because I had no tax returns, had no credit. So it took time for me to kind of, you know, start qualifying for that. And because I had the access and, and the connections and um, you know, a portfolio in Canada. For the first few years, I was investing in Canada. And then I started going into land development with my father-in-law who's a builder. So I really got, after about three years of being in the States, when I started acquiring properties in the U.S. And my first properties were in, in Ohio. It was just a lower air entry point. You're talking sub $100,000 for a single family home. I think you, you told me you bought you bought that one sixty five grand or something, and it was like a thousand dollar a month rent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, it was eighty grand, thousand dollars of rent and rent a month, and it was a turnkey property. The seller provided me financing, so it was like literally put thirty grand down, away you go. Um, so a really easy entry point for me, off market deal. And uh, Do you still own that one? No, I sold it after a couple of years. It did well, but. What I realized, I mean, these single family homes, you need a lot of them to really make sense mm. um, for me. And also, you know, the metrics, you know, even at that, even a deal like that's in that, in that kind of a setup, you only generate about two, three hundred dollars of cash flow, you know, uh, a month. So over the course of a year, you know, three thousand change of, of kind of net cash flow. Uh, on the 30 grand, it's a good cash on cash return, but then you have one hiccup like the, the roof or an HVAC, um, then that kind of goes through your cash flow. So or just even markets, some vacancy there too, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thankfully, the, the strong market, low vacancy, didn't have any 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 vacancy time during the, during the time I owned the, that particular property. But once I got into multi units and the commercial and the, and the mixed use, I said, you know what? I better utilize that app, that capital into bigger deals. So I ended up selling that. And a number of other smaller, you know, assets, and then reposition into larger deals. Because you did go ahead and like you're buying multis in Cleveland as well, right? Yes, correct. Yep. How many states are you across? 
Um, right now, I've got three states I'm focused on, uh, Ohio, California, and uh, Arizona. And so how did you choose those states particularly? Yeah, good question. So California, because I'm in California. Uh, it's my local market. And the deals I'm doing are not in my exact area where I reside. Um, I'm in a high-priced market in Orange County, similar to Toronto, but I drive up about an hour, hour and a half, the prices start coming down. Uh, we own a piece of land there. We're developing. We got approved for 172 units. So brought in some partners for funding, and we're looking to start, you know, breaking ground uh, Q2 of this year. Um, and that's and then we have several other projects in that area as well. Uh, we just have the the just the the main reason as a local market. Uh, my follow-on being a builder, just all the all all the pieces to make it fit. And uh, although you know it's a it's a rent control market. Most of you know, if you're building new, you set your own rents, so you don't have to deal with any of the you know landlord and tribunals and all that good stuff. Uh, similar to, to Arizona, we own a land as well. Uh, we'll be building brand new units. Uh, it just was a great deal, um, so that's another reason why we're in that particular market. And in Ohio, because that's kind of the market I started with, I have a good solid boots in the ground. That's another reason. So sometimes I tell people, um, either you have a strong local market to help support or the deal may dictate you and take you to a particular market and that's what happened with tucson arizona so are you looking from because i i mean you talked to me about a bit about this this weekend where the arizona deal is basically you're buying it you bought the land yep. you're going to develop it yep. two years yep you're going to refinance it and then after 10 years, there's no cap. If you hold the property for Correct. 10 years, there's no capital gains. Correct. So in the States, it's something called the Opportunity Zone. And if your property resides in that zone, uh, there are some benefits. And one of the main benefits is, is the capital gains can be basically uh, squashed if you hold it long enough. So it's That's an state incentive. Dependent. It's not just state dependent, it's location dependent. This It's something that they came up with about back in 2016. It's to spur development, and usually it's in lower, you know, lower class areas where they're trying to encourage development. So I was going to ask that. Yeah. Are you going to have to collect rent with a gun at these places? <laughs> Hopefully <or>? not. <laughs> Well, that's definitely not the plan. I mean, this is a gated community with amenities, pool, clubhouse. So the idea is we're going to attract the right tenant pool. That doesn't sound lower income to me. No, no. I mean, the <laughs> area itself hasn't really been developed. I mean, it's not that far off. It's right by the airport. Um, so there's, I mean, again, if you know, uh, Arizona in general is a lot of land. Yeah, you it's know, all desert. It's all desert. They can't grow anything on it. They, right. Yeah. So all desert, they've got plenty of land. So this one happens to be in a, in a, you know, in an area where there's good opportunity, happens to be in the opportunity zone. So we have that benefit holding it long term. But to answer your question, you know, we, visit, we visited vicinity projects, ones built like in the 60s and 70s, uh, vacancy, you know, very low vacancy, uh, you know, all older stuff, older product. And, uh, you know, uh, we got just to speak to the local property managers to kind of get a, you know, an idea of the tenant pool and profile and so forth. Um, it didn't, didn't scare us. At the end of the day, I think having a brand new project, being gated and having those amenities, it's going to attract you know, a higher quality tenant uh, profile. And you're going to, like that's going to be a rental, both of those are rentals. Yeah. Not, you're not selling them off. It's no, just exactly. Buy right. and hold, rentals. That's the game plan. What you know? What I explained uh, over the weekend was that we're creating a model, a duplicatable a model, because we want to scale in the multifamily, and we're looking to just build new and hold. So long-term hold, but build brand new units. Um, so we get around, you know, the the vacancies, or you know, just the, the tenant pool, or buying older assets which have you know rent control uh, rent right. control or older assets got a lot of capex you know you have to kind of factor in uh to get away from that build our own brand new units but we've designed um a, a type of a, a building which is not expensive slab on grade two to three story and in 24 to 30 unit you know um buildings so as we build we can rent and by the time you know we're in the last building we should have most of those units already built so Again, we've thought this so through. So you're not flooding 200 units on the market all at one time and Correct. trying to rent them. You're exactly. Okay, and there's 24. Hiccup. Here's that. Okay, and then you can say, oh, we're pre-leasing these because if you're ready to move in two months, these will be ready then. Exactly. Are you and getting any grants on those? 
Um, from the cities or the states? Not, not at the moment. Not nothing. Nothing in terms of grants. Um, Are well, they we, forgiving like property tax or anything like that? Or um, no, that'd be nice. I mean, obviously, again, right now that opportunity zone is the main incentive that we're receiving. Um, you know, compared to California, property taxes are lower in that in that area in, in Arizona. Um, the good thing is also like building in this process of 24 units, uh, 20 to 24 to 30 units. If there's a, any any issues with lease up or any issues with the market conditions, let's say the economy slows down significantly, we can stop. So phase one really is to uh, build all the main infrastructure, the pool clubhouse, and then build like two units, two buildings. So you talk about 50 units. After that, we can kind of pause and kind of assess the situation. If there's a huge demand, we'll keep going. But if things really slow down, we could stop right there and just wait and just time the market better versus like one structure that goes up and then you kind of, you know, you're kind of stuck. You, you can't stop building if it was one you know large building. Um, so again, simplified, no one, nothing underground, uh, outdoor parking. Um, well, it's a lot easier to do that in, in uh, Arizona and California than yeah, out here. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at white stuff outside that would prevent <laughs> you from doing that here. Salt all over the ground, water everywhere. Right. Well, I, I'm just thinking frozen pipes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so you talked a bit about this, and we didn't really touch upon this when we talked on the weekend. So what are there different rules in the three states that you're um, investing in for landlord-tenant? Because, I mean... We, I talk a lot about, obviously, Ontario and Alberta. Uh, Alberta is, like, free. You know, they, you know, you don't pay your rent. You're gone in two weeks. Yep. Um, lease ends. I can say, no, we're done doing business together. Please leave. Yep. Um, you know, you're paying. Please leave. You're disturbing everyone else. Get out, right? Yep. Uh, so, obviously, California has rent control. Is mm-hmm. it like Ontario where, like, that... It goes with the tenant or does it stay with the unit? So it's a good question. I mean, California, for the most part, is very similar to Ontario. I would say it's not as bad as Ontario, surprisingly. Um, there is rent control. The rent limit is about 4 to 5% versus here. It's like 1% or 2%. 2% this year, yep. Yeah. Um, there are some other programs, RUBS program and so forth, that would you know help to increase some of the cash flow. Um, for the landlords, if you're acquiring like assets which are you know very low rent, um, basically it's through the utilities. There are a lot of properties you know in California where the landlords paying utilities and they're getting receiving low rents. Uh, but surprisingly, there's some areas downtown LA which still have a moratorium where you cannot um, you cannot evict these tenants after what two and a half three years now through COVID. So. It's, there is very, it's been very challenging for certain landlords. Um, but saying that, again, markets outside of California, you know, that, that's one of the reasons. Arizona, Ohio, landlord-friendly markets, um, basically very similar, you know, as you mentioned with Alberta. You as a landlord have much more control, so you can set rents where you want them to be. You don't have to have rent continuation. So once their lease expires, like, thank you very much. You know, uh, rent's going up by 500 bucks. You can stay or you can leave. Um, and uh, in terms of eviction, short eviction times, um, there's, you know, uh, also the opportunity to add um, additional down payment, additional, like, um, uh, um, not just uh, first security and last, deposit. security deposit. Same, exactly. same with same with Alberta too. Yeah, yeah. So all that good stuff. I mean, again, you have the control as a landlord. I, uh, I shared we just recently bought uh, uh, a multi unit in Ohio in January. The actual lease contract states that the new landlord, upon a sale, can evict any tenant within sixty day notice, even if the lease has got like eight or nine month remaining. So. Not to say I'm going to do that, but it gives you the control as a landlord. So here in Ontario, that would be a, a situation where a potential buyer would actually want to go and do a cash for keys situation. But you don't even have to do that. You can literally just serve Correct. notice to the tenants. Exactly. Much more predictable, you know, in, in those rank, uh, landlord-friendly states where you can go in, analyze an, an opportunity, and say, all right, the rents are like $700. They should be $1,000. So... 
leases are coming up, let's say, in five months, eight months, 12 months. Okay, great. So at those moments, at those intervals, I can just basically approach the tenants in advance, say, listen, rent's going up on the new owners. We're planning to do some improvements on the property or the unit. Are you okay with the increased rent? If not, then, you know, just be prepared that you're going to have to leave type of thing. And that's it. I mean, there's nothing they can really do. I mean, well, I find this fascinating because I'm a student of economics that when there is no rent control, overall rents are lower, right? It just, it, it, it's funny how that works because in Alberta, like a two bedroom in Edmonton, a two bedroom rental, like you can get one for $1,200. Like you can mm -hmm. probably still get one for $900. I mean, you show me anywhere in Ontario where you get a two bedroom rental for $900 that anybody <laughs> wants to live. Not right? a chance. Like maybe, yeah. maybe Kirkland Lake, but even there, I don't think you get one up there now, right? Um, and, and, and I guess that's for California too. Like if you have a brand new rental building in California, you're going to get premium rents. Absolutely. Well, and you have to because you can't just say, oh, okay, let's fill it up because then you can't raise the rents. Whereas Arizona, you might say, hey, the pro forma looks okay, $200 less. Let's fill it up. And then down the road, once we have all the amenities built and everything, we can, we can bump it up a little bit. Yeah, it's a lot easier to get your timelines in there when you're taking a look at what your refinance is going to look like. right? Once you figure out your net operating income and you can actually you know, say, okay, we want to do this in 8 months or 12 months or 24 months, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's funny how that works, you know. I mean, looking at California, similar to Ontario, the rents are just through the roof. So the more control they put on landlords, the actually worse is making it for the tenants. Um, you know, like you mentioned Kirkland Lake, like we're, I've got property in Windsor. I mean, the, pro the price for two bedroom now, we're charging over $1,500, which is mind boggling. Like only four or five years ago. In Windsor. In Windsor. You're talking like when we started back in 2017, we're talking like seven, eight hundred, dollars $800 for a two bedroom. So again, you know, and in Ohio, I mean, average rents for a two bedroom are like nine, nine fifty. Um, so you know, we're going in finding you know opportunities where the rents are like six, seven hundred. You know, it's got about twenty five percent upside. Um, and also, you know, it's important to know your tenant profile. We we tend to be a little bit more. I mean, especially in, in Ontario, over renovate. Um, you know, to capture kind of the high price, but in these lower price markets or these non-landlord uh, or non-rent control markets, you're seeing, you know, the type of renovations that you need to do is not like over the top. You know, even property managers say, we're gonna go in there, we're just gonna paint, do some repairs, change some light fixtures, and just maybe clean up the floor. Usually these older buildings, they've got original hardwood floors, so you go in there and just reseal it, give it that shine, but we're not really replacing like a full gut bathroom or a full gut kitchen doesn't make sense. Then they tell us. I mean, the highest you're gonna get is like 900, 950 type of thing for like a one or two bedrooms. Why? Because in these markets, you can buy a single family home for 125 grand. Mm -hmm. You know, someone's not gonna pay you 1500 bucks because they're gonna go buy a house if that's the case. Yeah, and they'll get a 30 year mortgage and yeah, they'll have cost certainty for 30 years on that and away they go, right? Yeah. Yeah, thirty-year mortgages. Gotta love that in the U.S. Yeah. Locked in, <laughs> unlike Canada. Locked in, <laughs> fixed for thirty years. Yes, sir. What type of rates are you getting on that? Um, I mean, right now I spoke to a lender. I'm an escrow because I'm a realtor for a client of mine. Uh, she's locked in at four and a half, uh, but she locked in about a month and a half ago. If it was today, it'd probably be a, you know five and a quarter type of thing. But that's you know that's a personal residency. As investors, you're probably paying you know in high sixes right now, maybe sevens. Um, and again, you know, like it all depends on the strategy that, that, that multi-unit we, we acquired back in January, I've got an open loan, bridge loan at 12%. And I'm okay with that because we're just going to go in there, do some repairs, bump up those rents and then refi it into a long-term fixed in 30, 30 year rate. Now, a lot of people ask, how do you break a 30 year you know, mortgage type of thing? If you plan to sell it or so forth. So usually it's what's, what's called a, a sliding scale, five, four, three, two, one. So first year, it's a 5% penalty. Second year, 4% down to 1% year five. After that, no more penalties. But think of that. You lock in a rate for five, for 30 years. You know, that's why the rates going up doesn't affect the, U, uh, the U.S. as much as Canada. 
here, I mean, I know because I own assets in Canada, how, how much everyone's just very nervous and it's really kind of shaking things out for a lot of investors, for a lot of people, um, because everyone's mortgage is going to come up renewing, you know, in the next one, two, three years, max five years, right? right? So yep. uh, everyone's just a lot more nervous here uh, and interest rates just are, it, I mean, Canadian market is that much more sensitive to to interest rates going up. And just for context of time here for this, because it's going to take a few weeks for this to come out, but... This is literally a few days after the, the Silicon Valley Bank collapse. Yeah, yeah, like bond rates were down 10% today, Yeah, 7 to 10%. Yeah, And I think I just, I read uh, coming in here, uh, another bank actually, there's yeah, a second signature bank. Signature bank. Yeah, signature bank. And then bank. there was a run on another one. But then I, I saw Meet Kevin on his Instagram. He's like standing in front of Sig, or Silicon Valley Bank and he's like, no, oh, there's no one here. Mm. No, there's no run on this And because obviously the Fed backstopped it, right? and which we all knew, knew they needed to do. Yeah. And we all knew they were going to do it, but right. So at least I did. It's interesting. I mean, that whole conversation is interesting because like, you know, how that's going to play out. Is it more isolated or is this going to be like, you know, a real contagion? Uh, yeah. Contagion, like a snowball effect. Well, and this would have been if the Fed didn't backstop it. Like they, so what it, what it would have been would have been a flight to safety. Yeah. So it would have been, because that was the 16th biggest bank. They probably, I, I would guess, like the top five banks would have like had a huge bonanza of, of deposits, all the little banks they would have pulled from because they're like, well, if this can happen to the 16th. What about the 20th? What about right. the 10th? You know, let's not be silly. Let's just go ahead and do that. Like, I mean, Roku had half a billion dollars in this bank, right? So imagine Roku lost half a billion dollars, mm. like their share price would have been gone, right? All these tech companies, a lot of tech startups had right. all the money sitting in that bank. Yeah. Yep. What what would that would have gone to the the capital markets and and here and there and that's why the VIX shot up this morning, even after they said they were going to secure all the deposits. It was well over thirty at one point today on the VIX. Yeah. Yeah. It was a roller coaster. Like you could have day traded the crap out of this market. Yeah. If Rob wasn't so mad, he might have done it. Ah. <laughs> the fear of the unknown, isn't it? The fear of the unknown. Thomas, I want to rewind in the sense of, uh, like, you know, Canada versus the U.S., yes. right? And the reason, like, you moving down there was one of the reasons, but are you still looking at the Canadian market right now for investments, or are you 100% focused in the U.S. now? Uh, great question. I mean, I'm not opposed to investing in Canada. I've definitely scaled, tapered things back tremendously. I mean, just to see the opportunities in the U.S., kind of seeing what's how, what's played out over the last seven to eight months here in Canada, um, and just the, the focus and the deals I'm already involved in in the U.S., I think, yeah, most of my attention is focused in the U.S. However, I don't deter people from investing in Canada. I think Canadian market, I mean, it's ninth, I think, biggest in, in, in the world. Um, there's still plenty of opportunities. There's it's, it's huge relatively, opportunity. yeah, yeah, relatively yeah. safe. Your money's safe. I think if you're... If you know what you're doing and you are good at finding deals and opportunity negotiating, yeah, I think there's plenty of deals. And I'm not opposed to it. You know, I bought only one deal in Canada last year um, because it was a really good deal. As I'm not opposed to investing in Canada, but more and more I'm finding just a lot more interest from Canadians to invest in the U.S. So it's just my, my focus is just more more and more in the U.S. A couple of things that I've heard about that from 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 Canadians that are looking to invest in the U.S. is a lot lower, a lot more landlord friendly. Yep. Um, the cap rates, basically the uh, the. Oh my God! Sorry, guys. Um, yeah. So, where do you want me to go back to, Blake? Cap rates. Yeah. Um, the cap rates are much higher on the buy. Is that correct? And possibly, absolutely. I mean, right. yeah, I mean, we're looking at eight, nine caps in, in some markets. Right. So therefore, the cost per unit, even on 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 these buildings, is actually a lot lower. So the entry level of getting into these investments is, right. is a lot easier. I mean, just on that note, right? Cap rates are just an indication of the difference between an interest rate and, and a yield, right? Like that's just really what you. The only reason a cap rate's any good mm -hmm. is because it's telling me the money I'm going to make based on the interest rate. So if it costs me more to borrow money in the States, then the cap rates have to be higher. For which sure. on commercial properties, it costs you more to, because you don't have CMHC, right? Mm -hmm. Do you, there are some programs. Yeah, there are. There are some insurance programs, but you're not typically using those on these properties. So your interest rates on a 
commercial property is going to be at least 6% plus, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, there are some agency debt that you can secure for a little bit lower, but I don't think anything as far down as CMHC here in Canada. Um, but you mentioned, Rob, affordability is huge. I think um, one statistic I can share is average home, average property across the entire U.S. is about 375000 versus Canada is just under 800000 well, So it's funny, though, because uh, Gary Keller did this whole little thing where he did the markets and he said, listen, if you take out California, New York, and there was one other high price market, and you took out Toronto and Vancouver in, in, in Canada, and then you did the difference in um, in the exchange, yep. and you, yeah, difference in exchange, he goes, we're within $20,000 of each other. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I can see that. But the reality is the Canadian market in terms of size, population is small. Oh, like, yeah. Entire population of Canada um, is less than California, so I, I can totally see you know the numbers. If you remove some of these bigger you know states, um, they're gonna start leveling off. Well, they they just took the highest priced ones out. Oh, I think it was Hawaii, California, and New York yep. City. And he took those out, and he just wanted to compare. That said, hey, we're not that much different. Because right. obviously the our, our the dollar difference and whatever like that's right. obviously plays a huge. Uh, there are another things also to consider is like the tax. So taxes in Canada are higher generally, um, and everything from retail tax to income tax. Listen, you got you states and you got states that have no income tax. Yeah. You know, so how do you compare that to Canada and stuff, right? So you to go to even if the prices were the same, comparable Canada U.S., there are other factors to consider. Um, incomes, I think overall incomes in the U.S. Super, uh, surpass Canadian incomes. So I'm, I'm just gonna keep. Banging on the Alberta drum here because Alberta, Edmonton has one of the highest uh, household incomes in North America. It's like one hundred seven thousand dollars, mm. and their average house price is three hundred thirty thousand. Wow! So if you're not getting by in Ontario, huh? Just move out there. You can get a two bedroom apartment for eleven twelve hundred dollars, a really nice one for fourteen hundred. Right. Um, and you can go make eighty to one hundred fifty grand a year. I mean, absolutely. But people want to live where they want to live, right? I mean, look at people in California. Like, the average house why, price why? In, in, in Orange County, I mean, it's like a 1.3. I don't know, you know why anybody live in California now. I mean, it's... You, a, have, you have to share everything people, with homeless people. <laughs> well, it depends where you live. I mean, we're we're in a nice area. I mean, <clears throat> you want to have consistent weather. I mean, you're paying basically a sunshine, a sunshine tax, ultimately, you know. Uh, the, the cost of living is significant. It's probably three times higher than some of the lower price markets across the states. We all see on HDTV those homes in the U.S. mansions, and you're like, "Yeah, price is like 390." It's like, where is this 390? Arkansas. You know, it's like 4,000 square foot home on like two acres with a pool on, on a river. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think Tulsa, <laughs> Oklahoma, same thing somewhere around. Oh, man. It's I have like friends in Oklahoma. Yeah. Like, and I see their listings, and I'm like. Is that like two million dollars? Like no, four fifty. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's wild. I would come there. Yeah, yeah. And you see people you complaining. Oh, these prices are so high. I'm like so high. I have no idea. Well, then you have to live in like Tornado Alley though, or stuff like that, right? Right. But, well, I guess in California, like at some point, it's gonna fall into the sea. Well, so. that's, that's what they say. But after ten years of living there, I mean, the forest fires are actually a lot more of a problem than say earthquakes. I mean, we we're, we we face those on a regular basis. I've been there ten years, haven't felt one earthquake. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe you just don't, you leave at the right time. Maybe. I mean, maybe I sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question about the multifamily in terms of uh, long-term rent versus short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. uh, in these states that you're investing in, how, is there anything that's governing you from not having a short-term rental within these multifamily buildings or preventing it? I mean, short-term rentals are a particular strategy. Mm -hmm. I think uh, as investors, we need to determine what's our strategy and focus. We can't be spread in 10 different areas. Uh, so for me, I just focus not to be in short-term and short-term rental. Um, however, I partner with individuals who are who specialize on that because you need a, a team and the process and the system for that. A little more hands-on and so forth. So my strategic partnerships have just allowed me to, you know, be in a particular strategy, but not really be in it. If that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, obviously, there are plenty of markets which are more in favor of short-term rental. We were in uh, Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa, Florida in December for a boots in the ground event. And those agents are like, yeah, Tampa is game on. They love short-term rental. There's no very little restrictions versus, you know, you're down in Miami. It's like, oh, 
there's like very it's, it's all mapped out same with orlando and yeah. all those all the tourist spots right yeah. but um I, in tampa there are some sections where you can there are can whatever because yep. my buddy does a whole bunch of stuff down there um but talk about boots on the ground so you basically you take investors from outside of these areas and yep. like you went to tampa with i don't know what 30 ish but, people. yeah about 20 20 people 20 people yep. you go look at properties look at different strategies you hang out you eat you yep. you do whatever do a little bit of fun stuff as well yep. get to know each other but get to know the local market right yes and i think you're doing this again in um cleveland yep. coming up in june correct right yep. and um well so well, let's just talk about that a little yeah. bit because you've aligned yourself with Wealth Genius, right? Correct. Uh, I know you guys have another gr- um, another event coming up in April down in Irvine. Yes. And then you guys are going to hop over. And so that's just, a, is that a U.S. investing one again? That oh. is a U.S. investing one. Um, so pretty much every month there's something going on. Every and couple of weeks, man. And, and literally, it's nuts. becoming more and more, right? We just finished a, a two-day boot camp here in Hamilton. Uh, this past weekend, this upcoming month, yes, we have Irvine, California, two-day boot camp. That's going to be, it's going to be for local market, but we have people from Canada coming to that one as well. Then we are going to go to Vegas for a three-day multifamily event. Then the, the following month, which is uh, May, we've got a three-day event in Toronto. Um, and then we've got uh, June, as you mentioned, we've got five-day boots in the ground in Cleveland, Ohio. And... I, I, I've, I've gone to other people's boots in the ground over the years. And as, as an investor, it's a great, um, you know, experience because you're really, you can look online, you can Google things, you know, you can do the research, but really going to a particular city, really covering the lay of well, the land. Four or five days. Yeah. Four like, or five days. Like you cover you, a lot you're, of ground. You're getting intense. Like you're seeing everything, everything. there is to see. Like yeah. you're meeting the locals. Absolutely. And I'm bringing in like local experts from property managers, insurance agents to uh, other uh, commercial agents. And they're basically taking us through properties, different strategies. We went from co-living strategy to Airbnb to brand new multifamily to, you know, to so many different strategies within a short period of time. Um, And then whoever came had those contacts now. So they're leaving with a Rolodex of contacts for that particular market. The million dollar Rolodex. Yes, the million dollar Rolodex. <laughs> That's right? what Alfonso likes to say for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just speeds the process, cuts a lot of the, the waste of time and the challenge you may face. Because if you don't, I mean, if you don't leverage other people's resources, other people who are doing what you want to do, then, you know, it's up to you to try to figure that well, out on your own. It, and it just takes a lot of time. It's so funny. Like, People at the event were always ask me, like, what are you doing here? Like, what? you don't need this. You can go do this on your own. I'm like, yeah, 100%. But, you know, maybe I, I talked to Thomas and he's like, oh, you should talk to this one guy. And talking to that one person, like, cuts out three months of crap I would have had to go through. That's or a huge return on time. Ha- half a million dollars yep. I would have spent yep. that I didn't need to spend or I could do something different, right? 100%. And just to add to that, Mark... I uh, one of my students fly out from New Brunswick to attend this two day boot camp. He's already in Wealth Genius. He's already a student. So and he's flying out there for two days. He doesn't really need the knowledge and stuff, right? But Because he's, he's already in, investing. He's already investing. He's already getting the training and the coaching. He's already in the group, but he invested, you know, his his money to fly out, spend two days, hotel all his, on his own expense, just for an opportunity to see if something comes up. Sure enough, at the end of day one, he comes up to me, he goes, Thomas. I'm sitting beside a guy. I was telling him some of the stuff, you know, we're doing in Cleveland. And he's like, his jaw just dropped. He's like, I'll give you $100,000 ready to invest in your next deal. So he's like, Amazing. I made my day. He goes, I got hundred grand right now from someone to invest in my next deal. He goes, if I spend like five grand for this trip, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it makes yeah. sense, right? Well, and it's just planting future seeds, right? You never yeah. know which seed gets planted and what happens from there, right? 100%. Thomas, before we wrap up, why don't you tell us a little bit more about these events? Like how do people attend these? You offer some coaching as well, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Correct, correct. So as Mark mentioned, I'm part of Wealth Genius. I'm the U.S. coach and, and partner, and we're growing out the group. So we've got members in Canada and now in the U.S. as just well. Just over 600. Just so over it grew 600. Up from 100 last time this year to 600 yeah. in a year. I met Alfonso in person, the founder of Wealth Genius, this time last year. 
And at that time, had just over 100 people. In one complete year, in, 20, in 12 months, it's got over 600 members. Uh, we're onboarding U.S. residents as well now, U.S. investors. So the idea is now the Canadians have access to Americans for potential deal, boots in the ground, resources, partnerships can happen, and I'm seeing it. You know, students of mine are partnering with other students in the group, raising capital, sharing deals, and growing together. It's a really active group. And yeah, we've got events practically every week. So I'm more U.S. focused. So we've got events happening one, probably once a month U.S. focused. I come back and forth. So again, as we mentioned, I'll be out here in the next few months for various events. But in terms of reaching out to me, uh, Real Thomas Larini is my handle on Instagram. That's where I'm probably most active. I'm on Facebook as well, YouTube channel. But if you're looking for more information, reach out to me and, you know, set up a Calendly. I'll give you my Calendly link. We set up a 15-minute call and kind of see if there's a fit. I mean, ultimately, you know, I do provide coaching, mentorship. Um, we've got plenty of events where you can come out, just learn for a couple days and, and take it from there. Uh, but, yeah, it's just a great environment. Good people, like, you know, like this guy. This guy may be soon, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool environment. It's and we a, have fun. And that's the thing. We kind of balance it. It's education. You know, everyone wants to uh, create wealth for their families, but it's also some fun in there as well. It's a great sense of community, right? And everybody, you know, you can leverage the next person with knowledge that they have, whether it's a market, whether it's you get into a partnership together, invest in something like you said, right? Yeah. Real sense of community. That's, that's some pretty incredible stats in one year to grow that literally 600%. Yeah. yeah, it's been wild. It's been amazing. I'm just thankful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thomas, for uh, traveling all the way from California just to be on this podcast. <laughs> we really appreciate that. And if you guys are watching this on YouTube, do smash the like button. If you guys are listening to this on Spotify or Apple or any other podcast uh, link, if you guys could give us a five-star review and share this with all your friends, we're trying to get this out to as much people as possible and share the wealth. Thank you.